Hello and welcome to another edition of Film Sessions here. My name is Brandon. We're going to do another film breakdown of a recent Seattle Seahawk draft pick. One Mr. Trey Brown out of Oklahoma, a fourth round selection that the team is very high on. And from the onset with this pick, it's an interesting selection. I liked it. I liked it better than their first selection. I liked all of the rest of the picks, being that there's two more left <laughs> in this last draft. But this is a nice one, and what I like about it is it shows a little bit of going outside your comfort zone for a quality player. The Seattle Seahawks have gone through a bit of an evolution when it comes to their cornerbacks. When they came onto the scene in the early 2010s, there weren't as many teams out there that were willing to take on a six-foot cornerback. A lot of people forget about this, but it was a lot of, it was sort of this going cliched thought that if you had a six-foot corner or on up, they couldn't flip their hips. Say nothing about 6'1", 6'2", 6'3". Teams just weren't going to touch those type of players because they just didn't really trust that they could get it done. You would have the anomaly come around every once in a while. But now I think we look at where that's evolved to throughout the whole NFL, and pretty much every NFL team has at least one six-foot corner. Some teams even gravitate towards having two starters that are six-foot plus and on up. So that Seattle impact, that Coach Carroll impact, as it concerns the defensive backfield, has continued to motor along. As that evolution has happened throughout the NFL, there's also been an evolution within the team, where you have continued to gravitate towards these big guys who are six foot plus tall, 33, 33 inch long arms and up, almost with sort of a fundamentalist-like approach to it. And it's been a little bit of a rough one for Seahawks fans, I think, at times when you see them pass on very talented football players who don't meet that base metric size for cornerbacks. And there's a reason that they gravitate towards those big, long guys. It's not just because Carroll's just into the big dudes. It's not that. There's a schematic reason at play as to why they want to have a bigger, taller, longer guy. But this is where we come to Trey Brown, because Trey Brown is not bigger. He's not taller. He's not longer. What he is is an absolute fantastic football player. And what Seattle's doing is returning to the mold of old. But, but, but you say, wait, hold on, what are you talking about here, Brandon? You just said to us that the evolution's been that they won't go outside of that six-foot mantra. They don't leave it. Yes, it's true, and I still meant it. But what I'm talking about is mentality here. I'm talking about raw instincts. I'm talking about smarts. I'm talking about just a good football player out on the edge. And when you watch this guy's film, we're going to see he's a fantastic guy out on the outside, and he gets it done at about that sub-5, 10, 5, 9-ish range. And I think that the Seahawks' success this past season with a guy by the name of DJ Reed has really propelled this pick. John Schneider had to really talk Coach Carroll into a guy like DJ Reed. Seattle was in the midst of their we only take on six foot plus cornerbacks. And Schneider saw this five foot nine guy out on the open market for nothing. And he said, Coach Carroll, I've got a starter here for you. I've got a guy you can slide right on in if you just have some patience and wait for him to get on the mend. He had a little bit of an injury problem at that, at that, that time. And Coach Carroll did, trusted in Schneider after 10 years, and boy was it a benefit. Saved this secondary in a lot of respects. Seattle had seen their Dunbar uh, signing that they had made in the previous offseason fall apart quickly early on. They had some other injuries ranging out along that secondary. It was getting very thin. DJ Reed bursts on the scene and plays fantastic. In fact, he played right there with Ugo Amadi. They were neck and neck as far as playing the best at the cornerback position last year. So they see the success, and they see the fact that DJ Reed, who has a lot of the same metric size stuff that you would see in Trey Brown, and they go, okay, let's dip back into this well. Let's widen our scope out a little bit more once again. Let's give this a try. Kudos to them. That's evolution. That's not getting stilted in your thought process. That's being willing to take on the new. But the key is going to be, of course, and that's what we're going to look at today is, is he worth it? Is he worth it for them to leave that outside? Or is he simply going to be, as many pundits and draft experts will tell you, simply just a slot cornerback? It certainly will determine a lot of what his value is at this pick for. This is the second highest selection at the cornerback selection pick. I can say that right. That Coach Carroll and Schneider have made in their 10-year history with Seattle. They've never gone higher than the end of the third round, and now they've gone the fourth. I think it's telling. We'll see what the tale of the tape says. 
All right, we're going to start out this gig like we always do with a little bit of highlight package. You know, I like to get you guys hyped up for this player. And here we've got uh, Trey Brown down at the bottom of your screen here. And we're going up against Texas and Sam Ellinger. Whoa, Nelly, we've got a barn burner today. The 22 rank Texas Longhorns are taking on the Oklahoma Sooners. Oh, Nelly. So let's see what we've got here and what he's got in store for our Mr. Ellinger. Nice job with the footwork out the gate. Ellinger overthrows his man and intercepted. So it's a good little play. He's on his man in zone, playing the deep half of the field. Ellinger makes the overthrow. He's got his eyes in the backfield. You can see it here. He's going to be ready to make the play. This ball is going to this guy right here. Our guy's at the top of the screen, jumps off his man, ready for the overthrow. When they make a mistake, you are ready to capitalize it. That is just what you ask for in the Seahawks defense from its cornerbacks. Again, nicely done. This is a play that's a little bit like what we saw with the Israel Mukamu film, his initial highlight, where I pointed to a guy who initially has to play that cover three responsibility. So you can see him with his hips turned and flowing. He's not, he's not trying to stay sticky off the line here. He's trying to play to that deep cover three zone. That's his initial responsibility. And in a defense like the Seattle Seahawks, that is your main, that is your first responsibility above all else. Doesn't matter if the play calls for it or not at times. But what he does is he's watching the quarterback's eyes. See his head there. It's not turned to the man. It's turned to the quarterback. And he's looking for the opportunity to read route concepts to know when he can come up and jump on a play. So something about his film study that he's pointing to in his interview as being a real good film study guy, and I can see it in his tape. But what he sees in the film studies, I think I know this is going to be a comeback route so I can bail on that cover three responsibility. Now, it's a risk. If you do it and you get beat deep in a Coach Carroll-like defense like this, he might be apt to sit your butt for the rest of the year. So you can't get beat deep. But to come up and make a play like this, this is what can make you special in the Seattle Seahawks scheme. This is what can make you a little bit of a difference maker from a guy like Shaquille Griffin, who will be assignment correct, but who won't give you this kind of real flashy play on a consistent basis? And for Coach Carroll's defense does want the cover three and does want you to play it deep and does want you to protect, he also loves taking over the ball. They've got a whole day of the week practice uh, that they uh, allot towards just having the defense trying to take the ball away from the offense and the offense trying to keep from giving the defense the football. So it's something that they also value. And you can start to see a little bit why, just off his highlight package, why Coach Carroll might have gravitated towards him just a little bit. Here we're seeing him do a little bit of his kick return game. Uh, obviously, he's very quick, uh, gets up to his full speed fast, no surprise there. I don't think he's going to be doing this very much with the Seahawks unless we have an Eskridge uh, injury, because I think that's one reason, a big reason why they drafted Dwayne Eskridge on top of what he gives him as a receiver. This is a good play. Nothing substantial here on this play as far as him, I'd say maybe the least impressive interception, just a quarterback kind of throwing the ball up here, fourth quarter, trying to make a play, throwing a prayer. The The one thing I say I'll like about it is you look at him starting out here in this play, towards zone. So he doesn't have, I don't think, deep responsibility here. I think he's covering up right in this area. It's that he's watching the quarterback's eyes, as we saw with that first interception, and then based off of watching that eyes, he goes deep. This is third and 11. He's not worried about them uh, trying to, you know, dink and dunk their way up the field. He knows they need to go for it. There's only a minute here to go. I don't think they have any timeouts either. Throws it up, high points the ball, makes a play on the ball. Well done. Well done. Again, yeah, nothing fancy here, just quarterback throwing up the prayer. But he's got some ball skills. It's good to see. Doesn't look like he's got uh, stone hands. They're not, they're not amazing. I'll say that, but they're okay. They'll get the job done. Outside. Ooh, again, jumping the route. What you got to notice here is watch early on in this route. And so what you're going to do is I'm going to pause it and let you get a look here. So what we're going to do is take a look down here. This is our guy right here. On this guy. Now watch what he does with his press because that's what gets him the interception. Yeah, he gets the inter interception, pick, and ball skills and all that, but it's this right here that wins him this. Boop. 
catch it. Let's do it again. Boop. Press him right to the ground. Now that receiver gets back up and all of his momentum is gone. All of his momentum is gone at that point. And he's getting into his route. And the quarterback's under pressure. Boop. Right to the ground. Quarterback's under pressure. Has already basically decided, I think, pre-snap, if he gets under pressure, that this is where he's going to go with the football. And our guy's ready to make a play at that point because he's pressed him down so hard. And again, this is coming at you fast, but you can see here, he's just starting his first foot now into this route to get this going, where I'm sure the quarterback would have liked to have had him about right here, to where he can put that ball right into that spot. But instead now, he's got to trail away this, this way. The other defenders are over here tight. It's thrown off the timing of the play, that press. And so the quarterback ends up trying to throw it to the back shoulder, just trying to squeeze it into the slot. And our guy is there to make a play. Just well done. Well done. But it's that press and his press ability that makes this play happen. Make up speed, yes. But it's more that press and throwing off the timing of the play. More of his kick return game. Again, this is not really going to be what I think Seattle leans on him for, but it is something that he can do well enough. I don't think he's uh, enough of a difference maker at the kick return game to uh, take that over to Eskridge, who is probably a little bit better on what I saw from him with it. And nobody on the team can tackle him, so he comes up and says, let me get this done. I'll handle this. You linebackers, you defensive linemen, you go ahead and just chill for a sec. I'll come up and take care of business here. I'll get the jackrabbit. I'll get the jackrabbit. It's my pelt. Back with Ellinger. <laughs> I think Ellinger has probably seen darn near enough of Trey Brown at this point, don't you? He just gave him the double fist. He just said, what did the five fingers say to the face? Slap. <laughs> he just gave him. He just gave him a... A couple hands. He did him. He did him wrong there. Look at this. Just boop. Oh, Sam. Sam's looking right at him too. Like, damn, you just hit me in the face with two hands. With two hands. <laughs> he's a good blitzer. Now, this is a play that looks on its surface like he's beat deep. Nah, 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 nah. Look again. What we have here is. Up at the very top of the screen, you can see Trey Brown here, and it looks like this guy's coming up to block him. This is who his guy is, essentially. This guy's setting up like a bubble screen, and this is going to be the guy to catch it deep because he's looking like he's setting up a block, but he's going to actually go deep here in a second. So this is a little bit of a different thing of what it looks like, as you see after the guy makes the catch, that it looks like our guy is messed up here, but it's actually number 10 that's messed up. He's coming up showing hustle not giving up on the play, and makes the tackle. That is going to appeal to Coach Carroll. That right there made Coach Carroll probably wet himself when he was watching the tape, and, and rightfully so. His defense is a read-and-react defense, bend but don't break, rally to the football. It's going to want players that are going to actually rally to the ball. This kind of guy does that and shows that off with this kind of ability to stay with his hustle. Comes up, tackles. He's a pretty good tackler overall. Not amazing, but just pretty good. I think on these bubble screen type games, him running up like he does with his short area quickness, he's going to sniff that stuff out real quick. I think that'll be a big plus to his game is being able to stop those bubble screens, fighting right around the blocks, and being willing to be physical. Just a football player. Just a good football player. Again, they're just right on top of him. Sticky as hell in coverage. Even the receiver doesn't get up, look around for a flag. He knows he was he was straight covered. Well done. Let's go check out his senior bowl one-on-ones, and then we'll get into the game film. All right, so we've got the senior bowl tape here ready to roll. And the thing that I want to point towards is just the fact that when you're looking at this tape, do recognize, as we spoke about with Eskridge, that this is really set up for the defensive backs to fail. You have a quarterback here who's under no pressure with no off, no line to look over the top of. You have a receiver here who only has to work past the cornerback and then has all of this green grass to work with. As I understand it, they can basically freelance whatever route they want to run. They get pretty much about as much time as they need to get the route executed within reason. 
So again, if you see a guy get burnt in these drills or you see uh, some media publication tell you about how this receiver just worked all the cornerbacks in the field in one-on-ones, do please take it with a grain of salt. That said, it still gives us a little bit of an idea about him. The more information you can get, the more data you can get, all the better when it comes to trying to assess a player. So let's watch what we got here with Trey Brown here. Going up against the bigger guy. Good film, good film. So uh, interception. Now this is a little bit of a legendary film for Trey Brown in these one-on-ones because, as I said, because you are set up to fail, it's damn near impossible to come away with an interception in these type of drills. It's not easy at all. So when you do come up with an interception, people are going to be very impressed by it. He actually came up with two in these one-on-one reps. This one is now going to be probably called here at the end of the route. You can see him get his hand on the shoulder pad of the player to the point that he pulled the pad out from under the jersey. That is definitely going to be called as a holding call at that point, but still then does jump up and make the play. Um, let me show it to you here one more time so you can see what I'm talking about. You see him, if I can go back far enough, you can see him right here at the top of the route. Just pull up off a little bit. You see the receiver's momentum gets completely stopped. And Brown gets a little grabby. This is a concern with his game because that is a part of his game right now. He does get a little bit grabby. Fighting deep down the field. Nicely done. Stayed with the man step for step. Much bigger player there. That was better. Didn't get as grabby. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Again, physical. There's a difference between being physical and being grabby. You know, there's a difference between you, you, you're, you're jostling, both players are going back and forth, and you're going up and grabbing a guy's shoulder pad and tearing it down to keep him stopped. So down the field, keeps himself, walls off, comes back for the ball, ball skills catch, interception, that's legit. That one's legit. You know, keep your feet active. I like how light he kept his feet there off the line. That's what keeps you able to, in this point, still defend these short routes. That is what allows it to happen. So watch how quick he stays on his toes here. Pop, 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 pop. Up on those toes, just like popcorn. Pop, 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 pop. Right on those toes. So he can, can and he flips his hips nicely there. This should be the element of his game being a little bit of a 5'9, five, 5'10 five, guy. I want to see you flip and turn quick. There on Anthony Schwartz of Auburn. He does okay. It's a little bit of a bad pass. Kind of whistled in there. Here's Tylon Wallace. Kind of an overthrow. A little, maybe a little grabby there. And there he gets beat. And there he gets beat on a little bit of a comeback route. Receiver just kind of fights him off there. Nice job by the receiver. But good senior bowl tape. He uh, obviously, obviously did a good job there with getting the two interceptions. A little handsy on the tape, a little bit there, but not bad. Let's dive in and say uh, what he did in some of his game tape here. Okay, let's get a little feel for Trey Brown in game tape. Nothing speaks to you more than game film. Highlights are good. Senior bowl's good. Film, film is great. And nothing is going to tell more of a tale for you. So right out the gate here, we're going to have Trey Brown here lined up at the bottom of your screen in a press-type look at this point, which is good to see. That's where he's at his most uh, comfortable. Uh, I think he's a little bit less comfortable in off coverage. But with that said, uh, he's not horrible there either. He's just kind of like a guy out to sea for the first time, getting his sea legs in that kind of press look. So... Nice job out the gate. The pressure just kind of gets to the quarterback. He throws it away, but uh, he was there impressed there. He looked okay off of our initial spot. Right now, for some reason, this isn't going to... All right. Jumps back. So this one is, he does give up a completion here, but this is a little bit more of... You've got a stack line of scrimmage. Look, we have five guys on the line, number three linebackers, a safety, or two linebackers and a safety up there. So you got a single high look over the top. The corners have to have to play to that cover three look here, so that's going to open stuff up underneath because the linebackers aren't going to get to the flat routes uh, as easily at that point uh, to kind of buzz them a bit. So it's, it's okay when they give up this kind of completion. You're going to see this kind of completion given up in the Seattle Seahawks scheme. 
it's part of the downside to giving up, to not giving up the deep ball and protecting deep. Now, in this play, I, I, this is another spot that I, I like this kind of play from the aspect of it shows a little bit off of what we saw from we saw from Trey on the interception he had where he pressed the man to the ground. The man gets up with no momentum, gets the interception on his highlight package. Well, here you get the same thing without the interception. He presses the man so well here at the bottom of your screen, presses him so well that he throws the whole timing of the playoff. You'll notice the quarterback's going to try to hold the safety, looking straight up over the top to hit a whole shot here on the outside. Looks like a cover two look here. And so it's the press that gets it done, though. It's the press that ends up accomplishing the task at hand here where the ball gets overthrown. And we'll rerun it again from the top in a second here, but this is a, a type of play I just love seeing in him. Press, press, press. Throw off the timing of the throw here. The receiver's not even in frame. Like, Trey's ahead of the receiver. He's more in a position to – he's more in a position to make this catch than the receiver is. And, again, this is all off of that press. That press never allowed that receiver to get and stack up on top of Trey Brown and say nothing of stacking, never allowed him to even get to an even status with Trey. Trey's got him beat. It's an underthrown ball because the – if it is an underthrown ball because the safety's driving on it, it's an interception. So great coverage by Trey Brown here. This is a big element to what he gives you in his game. Again, we got him in press. It's just a run play. Press again. Now on this play, this is an in, this is a, a completion. This is a play where you're going to get a completion if he doesn't get help from his defensive line. Because he does press his man off the line, but he's so in on his press here. It's so a big part of what he wants to get done that the man does a good job of breaking off that press and actually breaks open here. So you can see he's four or five yards ahead of our guy there. He does love his press. I mean, you can make the argument that he falls a little bit too much in love with it at times. And he needs to just see how wide open that guy would have been if if Trey if Trey's not there. Uh, if Trey doesn't get better into that press. So most of the time he doesn't bang, I'm open. Most of the time guys don't get that quickly off and turned inside on him. But he's going to be dealing with bigger receivers at the next level. He's going to be dealing with guys who, oh, you're 5'9", you're going to try to press me? Watch what I do with that. There's a lot of this evaluation is about whether or not Trey Brown can play on the outside or if he is only going to be a slot guy at the next level. Seahawks had success with DJ Reed last year on the outside. Doesn't mean that now everybody can play on the outside that's five foot nine. Especially now as we've got an NFL that is driving towards more bigger corners on the outside. Here we got him nicely up there, trailing. That's fine. Okay, instead of sticking with that Oklahoma State game film, I've decided to transition over here to a different game. It seemed that Trey Brown, somewhere around the mid-third quarter or so, was taken out of that game. I don't know if it's because of injury or because the Sooners were just romple stomping the o Oklahoma State team. But either way, let's go over here to another game, get another little bit of taste for this player, and then we'll round that out a bit here. So I've decided to choose this Texas game film where you have them going against, of course, the 22nd rank Longhorns. And they are manned by Mr. By Mr. Sam Ellinger. A guy at this time who's trying to generate some momentum for his draft stock. So he definitely has some skin in this game. Texas, of course, comes in 2-1. and one. Oklahoma 1-2, one and two, kind of scuttling a bit. And right out the gate here, we can see our guy, Trey Brown, here in off coverage. A little bit of almost inside leverage here. As you can see here where his foot comes out here, here, here. So he's trying to take him and already subtly force him a little bit to the sideline, which is interesting to see. But we're going to let this footage play a bit and see what we can uh, take away from Trey Brown. All right, nothing fancy there. Bubble screen off the drop. We've got him at the bottom of the screen again. Good footwork, forcing that receiver over. It's a running play, so not much really happening there. Again, up now, up and press. Nicely done, gets the interception. Uh, so let's take a look at this one really quick again. This reminds me of his senior bull tape a little bit on this particular one. Not a bad play, great play. Okay, so this is a great play. 
But I think what we're going to see here is he's he's going along well. Everything's going good. Do, 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 get right up into here. Then right about here, he gets a sudden pull. Sudden, I'm going to grab on you right there, pulling the receiver back, launching himself forward to get the interception. Let's see if that's how I'm seeing it right in the way I first saw that play out. Pull back, grab that interception. Now, it would seem to me that <clears throat> they didn't call it there as there was a punt on the play, and he's going to get credit for that. And that's the thing about being on the line, you know, living living essentially on the line with how you play. He's right up in press again, hands on him. That's That subtle little last move where he's pulling on the shoulder pad this is, it's, this is really kind of one of those dark techniques of the position. You know, those kind of things they don't talk about at parties. But it is part and parcel of the position. And you get away with those moments of that, even at the NFL you will, because he wasn't being grabby all the way up through the route. He just was grabby at a certain key moment. Now, sometimes the officials are going to catch you with it, sometimes not. But when they don't and you intercept the ball and it's a game-changing play, Everyone's happy about it, and you're just called a physical player. When you're called for a couple of holding penalties over the course of a game, people will say he can't play the position because he can't keep from holding on to guys. It's a, uh, it's a fine, treacherous line. So, so far right now, they haven't really gone after him. That was more kind of a zone thing they were attacking as they're trying to circle the safety there. He came out and helped. Came back in the play later on. You'll see him flash up to make a tackle. He shows hustle. We saw that on his highlight tape. He shows hustle. You don't have to worry about effort with this guy. Coming off on a blitz. Nothing to really do there. Looks like we got a lot of running here by Texas. They're not trying to trust Sam Elling or throwing the ball, especially after that interception by our guy. Okay, so he's back on the field now, finally. I don't know if they were giving him a quarter of blow there for whatever reason because this is a bowl game. I thought for a second they were just going to take him off the field all the way along, but instead we are now seeing him back on the field. This uh, Texas offense, God bless them. I don't know how they put 17 points on this field. This offensive line's not able to block for a half a second. Ellinger has been under heat the whole time. Uh Takeaways from the coverage what we've seen so far of our guy. You know, he's been fluid. He's bottom of your screen. He's playing that off coverage stuff that we'd see. This is a little bit, though, of why you love to have a ferocious front four in front of a corner like this. And now he finally does give up a completion after getting that interception early. So let's look at this since we finally have something here. Now, bomb your screen, bail coverage, come up, make the play. This is a, a play that Carroll and company on the coaching staff are going to be okay with. This is a play that you would very oftentimes see Richard Sherman give up. Let's think through the schematics of this, or not the schematics, but maybe the mechanics of this on a play. You're playing off coverage already, five, six, seven yards, but then your responsibility or your instruction is to then drop further back in coverage to protect against that deep side to make sure that you always have that little bit of head start that little bit of ability to always stay on top keep keep the cork inside the bottle and that's just what he's doing that's always going to open you up to certain things we saw this on a completion in uh, the prior film where you're going to give up a play underneath from time to time but you're relying on the pact that over the course of a game an offense is going to grow impatient they're going to take that shot with this type of coverage and then you're going to be able to cash in. So as long as you're there to make the tackle, there's no yak yardage afterwards. Coaching staff will give you a plus grade in their measurement as far as the Hawks are concerned. And that's what's going on here. Just simple little slant route in, not crazy. A little slow off the ball there with the drag route, but Ellinger didn't see it. Top of your screen now. 
Just beautiful. Beautiful. I know this is a catch. I know that this somebody could also be this is one man's <laughs> one man's gold is another man's one man's trash is another man's treasure. Uh, this is that kind of play. Because in this play, I see a guy fluidly turning his hips with that same coverage of deep responsibility coming back up on the ball. Pop, 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 back up on the ball driving. Now, the man who says this is trash says he gives up a completion because he's a midget and uh, he can't catch. And I say, they're called little people, pal. So not only are you insensitive, not only are you that, but you also don't know football. But I, I think more often than not on that type of play, there's good things that happen by you driving on the route like that. And I, you know, keep in mind, he's getting this close with the responsibility that he's supposed to have played that deep off the jump. That's, um, again, we start to see what it is that were the traits that appealed to Coach Carroll and company here. So we're into the fourth quarter. They're up 31-17, and they've already shown a propensity to take him off the field, and it looks like, indeed, they are doing that here. <laughs> Once again, so not a lot of tape we've been able to go off of here with the game film. And as uh, both games, we get about a, a half worth of footage of our guy. So let's go for one last little bit of tape, see what we can make as an assessment here. Okay, this, so this is going to be our last bit of tape we're going to watch here on Trey Brown is a little taste test, a little smell test, a little, <laughs> little sniffer. We got him here at the top of the screen, of course. If you want to look for him, always look for him usually on the strong side of the formation. This is where quarterbacks are going to be at their best, throwing to their right. If you're wondering, why is it that you can tell that from a cornerback if he's on the right side of the format? Because of that. And the statistics back this up. The percentages back this up. The accuracy rates back this up if you look at quarterbacks and how they're charted. So you want to put your best cornerback on that side to be tested over there because there's a good chance the offense is going to go to that side. This is one of the reasons why I hate absolutely despise the thought process of asking a quarterback to move around and follow a wide receiver around because he very well may be taking out the best player from a, an opposition standpoint, but he might be opening up strong side throws to vulnerability, second cornerbacks, lesser talent over there covering. But that's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother time. Let's concentrate here a little bit on Mr. Brown here at the top of the screen and see what he's got to offer for us in this particular game. Well, tacked right off the rip here, huh? Don't have to wait long. Do not have to wait long. Let's see what we got here. Looks like there's a little bit of a mix up there as far as coverage goes for just a second. I see a tiny bit of hesitancy between who's going to cover what. And he's a little late there on that because of it. I will say this, though, as well. His, when he's off ball, as opposed to up in press, he's not as comfortable. He just doesn't feel, you can tell with his body language, he's just not quite as comfy there. It's not a death now. Boy, back-to-back -back plays, giving up, giving up some completions. Okay, let's look at this one. It's the first one again. Here comes number two again off coverage. Comes up. I, I, I think again on that one, as opposed to even the first one, which was a little bit far down the field, that's going to be one, and again, the third one in a row. So... We, boy, a rough start for our our dude here. Rough start for our dude. You know, this isn't this is not a how he's not having a good start to his day. And the first one is legitimately problematic because this is a post route basically down the field. And that's a big chunk play which Coach Carroll doesn't want to give up. This one will be excusable because they haven't been off coverage, and it's not his responsibility to take away the short stuff necessarily. Now, this one, similar. Again, playing off coverage. Let's go back just for a second here. Again, playing off coverage. And it's not the worst thing between these three catches he's given up. 
you know, 40 yards. Two of those catches are probably excusable by the Seahawks standard of things. It's uh, a smart attack by the offensive coordinator here going after him in this, in this realm. And they come right back to the run. For an intelligent opening drive by Texas Tech here. But the first one with the post route is going to be the one that would be bothersome from Coach Carroll. You say, that first one I don't like, the other two, okay. We, we'll, you'll see a few of those in our defense over the course of a football game. And if a guy can occasionally draw on those routes or drive on those routes later on, you're okay. And again, he gets attacked. Man, our guy is having a little bit of a tough day here now. Read option to the post route. Kind of maybe more of an in, in cutting route there. Again, an off coverage. Yeah, just kind of slow to react to him on the turn on the route. Hmm. I got some wonder, and I'm I'm thinking out loud here. Is I've just got some wonder with him as far as the outside goes. Just some things I'm a little concerned with. Little tiny concern. Because Seattle's going to ask him to play off coverage quite a bit. This is not just an unusual thing for him to do. He's going to do it a lot. He's got to be proficient at it. Unless Seattle's looking to go back to just that old school press look and they're going to lean into the blitz stuff that they've been doing in recent years more heavily. Makes a lot more sense. But even then, how much is a five foot nine and a half, five foot ten guy going to be able to press a six two six three guy if that if that's what he's going to be trying to do? Top of the screen. Looks okay there. They're, they're not attacked him as much as early on there, but he's certainly given up four catches here in just the first quarter alone. Now he's back up into his comfortable place, looking into more of a press look. Balls the guy up the football field. You've got to go to press if you're going to have this guy starting. He's backing off coverage now. And the quarterback drops it. <laughs> a couple of tip passes here. The quarterback's not happy with his guys. Catch it. Just catch it. And they're like, why don't you cut your hair? There he goes, fights off block, gets in there. Good. Feistiness. Love to see it. Oh, there we go. There we go. You see, this is this is where you really like it. Okay, you're, they're going to get you with stuff early on, right? You, they're going to come at you with a certain direction to things. Okay. Okay, say la vie. Now you got to react. Bang. I was just talking about it. Can you, in those, you, you give up the short completions. Dink, dink, dink. Now, when it comes to later on and you've seen it and you know it's coming and you've done your film study and you're smart enough to understand they're going to do it again, do you have the guts, do you have the smarts to jump at that point and make a play on the ball? That throw that he threw in there was just a little bit off. Gets intercepted because he's putting himself in the right position there to make that kind of play. Excellent job by him. Excellent job, just not on just the play, but on the adjustment. Not going towards him. He's he's either top of his screen or Oklahoma's doing that thing again here where they rotate out. I think that's him at the top. Where they rotate out their corners for some weird reason. I guess it's 42 to 7 at this point. So they're getting barrel rolled. They're probably like, let's bring in the freshman. Let's bring in the freshman who proceed to give up a huge play. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see him in the game anymore. Let's go to our final thoughts on this. We've got a couple of different games to go through, but I think we got an initial good read on this guy. Trey Brown, what a fun player to watch and what I think is a very good selection by our Seahawks in the fourth round. If at the bare minimum you're walking away with in the fourth round a upper-level starter at the slot corner position, that's a good pick. I'm hopeful that he's able to do more than that because you are sitting pretty strong right now at slot if you're the Seahawks. Hugo Amadi had a good year last year. You're getting Marquise Blair back from injury, so you're already too deep there. This guy certainly can come in and give you competition and let the best man win, but my hope would be that you could keep Hugo on the field and still bring this guy out to the outside. 
certainly on his college tape. He's played pretty much exclusively on that outside edge. They trusted him to do that at 5'9", and he held up well there. He seems to be able to press anybody that he has to press. Does get a little handsy, does press for a little bit too long of time at, at points, which is going to draw flags at the next level. Don't be surprised to see some, some, some yellow flags thrown in his direction out the first couple of years. But can he be, be effective in between that? Can he get you a couple of those game-changing interceptions because he's recognizing route concepts like we saw in some of his highlight packages? That's really a big key to him. As far as if he can play on the outside, and my main concerns with him on the outside, it's not footwork, it's not whether he can press the guy, it's not whether he can run with anybody. My main concern is the deep down the field coverage, where on some of the film I think we're going to see as we lead up here, you're going to see him a little bit get lost deep down the field, where he'll be trying to sort of drape on a man, look back for the ball, keep his feet moving, doing all those three things at once, and one of them ends up failing out at times, which has him get lost as well as when you have a guy about 5'10-ish, a little under 5'10", and he's going deep down the field with a guy that's six foot three and who can jump higher than him and has ball skills, there's just going to be times where you're going to watch him and there's not a lot he can do if he gets matched up at that big type of wide receiver. Again, it didn't show up a lot in his tape so far on the college level, so it's a concern I have that I can't necessarily back with a, a ton of footage to say, see, see, this is where he's not going to be good in. It's just where the concerns come into play and why we want to watch a little bit more tape with this guy to make an accurate, complete assessment. Either way, he's a great player in exactly what the secondary needs. Many Seahawks fans harken back to wanting the Legion of Boom era days, to looking for the same type of players. Get the last Richard Sherman we had. Get the last Cam Chancellor we had. Whereas, rather than look at that, I think they should look at for more of what kind of dogged mentality, what type of guy who pairs both a skill set with just a certain way he goes about his business on the football field and that those things blend together and that that in itself is what created somewhat of the Legion of Boom. Richard Sherman wasn't a freakish skill set guy. He was pretty good, but he wasn't freakish. Cam Chancer wasn't freakish. Brandon Brown wasn't freakish with a skill set, but they were all in on football. These were guys you knew were, were gym rats, film study guys, guys who were going to do everything it took to get any kind of edge that they could on the football field. And when it came to game day, they knew that they were in a 12-round fight, and they were going to fight every one of those rounds to the utmost. They were going to lay it all out on the line. It's been missing from our defense over the last six years. It really has, and it's just sort of drained away with that Legion of Boomera. But this guy, Trey Brown, he gives you a return to that. Last year's pick in Jordan Brooks gives you a return to that. Marquise Blair, if he could stay healthy and get on the football field, gives you a return to that. Jamal Adams, with his mentality that he brings, definitely gives you a return to that. Now it's not a matter of you having one or two of those guys, but you're starting to fill up a whole defensive backfield, a whole defensive front line with guys who fit into that mold. And once you do that, you start to create the elements and the prerequisites to recreating a Legion of Boom-like effect on the defensive side of the ball. My name is Brandon. Thank you for watching Film Breakdowns. Go Hawks.